Sometimes I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, I sing my Savior God to thee, my God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my soul, my Savior God to thee, Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, my God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. Amen. All right, let's see. What else will we play here? Let's see. I am way behind, man. I am busy, busy, busy. Probably almost. Almost too busy to do a broadcast because I'm heading into the busiest time for the next, not this week because we're going to wait a week, but State Fair first week, State Fair second week, and then the defeat of Jesse James Day's the third week. We are extremely busy, folks, and heading into even busier times. So praise the Lord for that. Conquering now and still to conquer, rideth the king in his mind. 
the host of all the faithful into the midst of the fight. See them with courage advancing, clad in their brilliant array, shouting the name of their leader. Hear them exultingly say, Not to the strong is the battle, not to the swift is the race, yet to the true. Now and still to conquer Who is this wonderful king? Whence are the armies which he leadeth While of his glory they sing He is our Lord and Redeemer Savior and monarch divine They are the stars that forever Bright in his kingdom will shine Conquering now and still to conquer, Jesus, thou ruler of all. Thrones and their scepters all shall perish, crowns and their splendor shall fall. Yet shall the army thou leadest, faithful and true to the last, find in thy mouth. To the strong is the battle, not to the swift is the race. Yet to the true and the faithful, victory is promised through the race. Not to the strong is the battle, not to the swift is the race. Yet to the true. Amen and amen. Like a prodigal son, I wandered in darkness and I traded my life for a worldly good time. No peace in my heart I ever could find. And I got so tired So I believe I'll go home and meet with the Father. The table is spread and they're waiting for me. I can see the Father coming down to greet me. And Lord, I'm willing to be just a servant for you. Like a prodigal son, I wandered from Jesus. But the good shepherd saw through the heat and the cold the ninety and nine he left in that fold. Just to find this lost sheep that was hungry and cold. So I believe I'll go home and eat with the Father. And the table is spread and they're waiting for me. I can see the Father coming down to greet me. And Lord, I'm willing to be. Just a servant for thee, and Lord, I'm willing to be just a servant for
What's wrong with the old black book my daddy used to read from? Is it so outdated by modern translation? Read high standard and good news are everywhere I look. Oh, won't somebody tell me what's wrong with the old black book? People who know not my God just cannot understand the spiritual inspired word of God not given by some man. They've all agreed by joining hands in a worldwide movement to change that blessed old black book to set out to improve it. What's wrong with the old black book my daddy used to read from? Is it so outdated by modern translations? By standard and good news are everywhere I like look. Oh, won't somebody tell me what's wrong with the old black book? Jesus said, I am the shepherd, my sheep follow me. As the voice of the stranger speaks, they shall turn and flee. The words my daddy used to read, I've learned to love so dear. But all these other words I hear, strangers to my ears. What's wrong with the old black book my daddy used to read from? Is it so outdated by modern translations? Revised standard and good news are everywhere I look. So won't somebody tell me what's wrong with the old black book? Well, the enemy is much too smart to jump right in and say, just forget all that you have learned of God, cause it's not true anyway. And they're making plans in years to come to take God from our minds by giving us new Bibles changed a little bit each time. What's wrong with the old black book my daddy used to read from? Is it so outdated by modern translations? Revised standard and good news are everywhere I look. Oh, won't somebody tell me what's wrong with the old black book? What's wrong with the old black book my daddy used to read from? Is it so outdated by modern translations? Revised standard and good news are everywhere I look. Oh, won't somebody tell me what's wrong with the old black book? Somebody tell me There's no one who can tell me What's wrong with the old King James King James Amen What's wrong with the old black book? Absolutely nothing. And that's why they hate it so much. I'm telling you, do you know what I, I I'm telling you it's coming. I, I, I just, I, I don't like to go off of feelings at all, period. But it's, it's coming. I'm, I'm seeing out there, I'm seeing from these reformed guys and these MacArthur guys and 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 all these guys they're they're gearing up for a battle and they want to fight is what they want to do and 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 they want to fight about the book and i'm in i'm all in i want to fight too i i want to fight with them cuz i believe they're being a they're using a sword that i can slash with the sword of the lord I'm I, I I'm telling you it's it's coming and I hear it and I'm about to make some reform people really mad. Not today. I'll save that for another day. But it's coming. So what I need to do is I need to buy. I'm gonna have to buy uh, old Johnny Max reformed uh, new reformed uh, study Bible. I, I'm going to have to buy that. I'm, I'm just going to have to. So Scott, you put that down on the list there. We're, we're going to have to, we're going to have to get the reformed, st whatever study Bible he's got. And everybody's saying this is the best thing since sliced bread and all this other stuff. Well, they're gearing up for a battle, and they like to make fun of King James people. Well, that's fine. Them and James White. I'm glad I'm not on James White's team. I don't want to be on his team. I don't like him very much. I think he's I think he's an arrogant blowhard is what I absolutely think he is, to be honest with you. 
I don't have very much respect at all for somebody that doesn't know if they have a Bible in their hands or not and can't show me where I can get the perfect words of God inspired in the originals, which they don't have. They don't have the originals, so then they don't have an inspired book. Wonderful. You got a book full of errors. Great. Well, I'm ready. I, I want to get into it with them. I, I, I shouldn't say I'm ready. I'm not ready right this second. But after the State Fair and after I get done with the defeat of Jesse James days and after, after we get past some of that, I, I've been telling people for a while. I've been telling people for a while that, you know something, I, I believe God's leading me to teach our children at church why we, keep to, why we hold to the King James Bible. So I may spend the winter uh, months teaching them why we hold to the King James Bible. And it may be something that we end up doing in the winter, uh, mixing that at one week and the next week. I'm not a debater, Carl. I don't debate people. I preach. That's what I do. I preach and I give the facts, but I don't debate. I'm not, I'm not interested in debating any of them with their intellectual arguments. The thing that I'm interested in doing is bringing the Bible to them and showing them the facts. Whatever they decide to do with it after that, that's their problem. But I'm I, I'm not going to let them sit and accuse God's word of being full of errors and old Johnny Mac comes along and he's going to fix all the errors of the Bible. Sorry, I just don't buy it. But anyway. Um, but. Oh, it'll be interesting enough when I pull apart that Bible. It'll be interesting enough. Believe me. So we'll figure out when, when, and, and by the way, that'll just be a sub study. That'll be a separate one on not including what I'm going to teach our children. I'm going to have to teach our children systematically through the Bible issue. They need to know. See, I have, we have over 40 children and more coming. Not not me personally, but our church. We have we have 40 children there now, I think, and there's four women with child now. So I chuckled years ago and I and I told my wife and she laughed. She's like, not the way you preach, but uh about having 500 people. Well, all I know is if these women keep having babies. We're going to get to 500. <laughs> if we keep doing it four or five at a time, we're, we're, we're going to end up with 500. <laughs> They're all going to be babies, but we're going to. Anyway, so we, we are going to tackle those subjects. By the way, I've got 22 people, it says. On on um on uh, on uh, sermon or not sermon audio on YouTube right now. Who wants to believe that I'm being shadow banned right now? Anybody care to think that I'm being shadow? I'm always shadow banned. I had the same number of subscribers for five years in a row. So anyway, these are the games that people play, but. We are on Rumble, and you can get to us on Rumble. So watch us over there. Support Rumble. Get over there and support Rumble, because we need more people on Rumble. We need to fill Rumble up, and we need to figure out. I wish that chat would go. I don't know what the deal is with that. The chat I, the, would go on Restream so I could see what everybody says from Rumble. So anyway. Um, we are going, we are going to, uh, deal with that issue of the King James Bible issue in the future. And it might be something that really gets a lot because I'm going to have to, I have a duty to our children to teach them, to teach them why we hold to the King James Bible. Uh, because these guys have an imperfect book, and they, they say, inspired in the originals. Well, you don't have the originals, so then you don't have the Word of God. 
Well, that's not good. Anyway, I didn't come to talk about that today, but for some reason, I just, I, I'm telling you, I, I've had it for the last, now, nothing to do with MacArthur's Bible or anything that prompted that. It was, I was going to teach our, but then I'm starting to see all these people talk about, oh man, these, this is so good, this MacArthur Bible and, and, uh, and all this other stuff and it's the best thing in the world and all this, uh, and okay. All right. I know, James White and Steven Anderson, they're great together. Anyway. So we're going to, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to have to. And I'm not even going to zero in on the MacArthur Bible at, when I teach our children, because I'm trying to teach them about the King James Bible. So lots of studying will come to place, uh, come to pass with that, and it may be something that I have to do all winter. I might do it. See, I got to figure out how I'm going to do that. I got to put that schedule together, and we got to learn about the Bible at least three to four hours a month. So we'll maybe when it's cold, I'll add some extra time in there uh, and all that good stuff on for our children. I want it to be understandable for them as well and all that good stuff. So we will get into that. Hey, pray for us. We're not going out preaching to the Steel County Fair this week because we, we still got some folks that are got some colds and some other things and families are real busy right now. And we are going to be nonstop eight days. Uh, well, not nonstop, but we have the State Fair next Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Then the following weekend, we have this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday State Fair. Then the following week after that, we have the Feet of Jesse James Days. We have that Friday, Saturday, and tracting on Sunday. We are going to be extremely busy for like nine of those days out of three weeks' time. Nine of those days are going to be filled with preaching for hours upon hours upon hours. So... And tracting. So we are going to be busy. So we're going to take time for the families here this week. And then next week, we're going to hit it for the state fair and everything. You pray for our ministry. Pray for our needs to be met. Pray for safety as we travel because we're going to be driving with 15 guys in a van uh, all over the place uh, and evangelizing and doing all that work. So you pray for us and pray for the Lord to provide. For our needs, uh, all those uh, things that, that we do, we're going to be ministering to thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. So lots of people, lots of stuff going on. We'll be, we'll be broadcasting live at different times from the fair, uh, outside the fair, and from the feet of Jesse James days. So... Lots going on, so you pray for us that we'll have safety and that all will be well. We definitely have a lot going on. Now, we are going to get into Patricia King here. Patricia King is an absolute raging heretic. And she is a charismatic Jezebel witch that teaches the servants of the Lord and seduces the servants of the Lord to sin against him. Now, the reason why I included Dr. Michael Brown, because Dr. Michael Brown is an apologist for the char he is the gatekeeper for the charismatic movement. Now, Void X says, you're the expert on who all the charismatic witches are. If it wasn't for you, I honestly would never hear of any of them at all. I never have any idea who they are when you present them. Well, you may not know, but let me say this to you. 
hundreds of thousands of people support this lady. And I'll show you that today. I give you a big injection of the blood of Christ. You're the devil in disguise. I, I really feel this needs to be addressed because if we um, are, are trying to bring biblical values and kingdom values into the now, but we are living anti-biblical values, then we lose our voice, but we also lose our authority. We're actually giving our authority over to the enemy. And, and obviously we lose our moral authority in the eyes of the world because they look at us as hypocrites, and then our spiritual authority because God's not backing us in that same way. We're just talking the ghost. You want some? <laughs> and so, and so I've been enjoying this new, you know, it's new for me anyways. I, you know, <laughs> I mean, we used to take the wine barrel and go, you know, whoa, you know, and get all filled with the new wine and, you know, but now, you know, <laughs> So I came in this morning and I couldn't resist. I was in the hospitality room and, you know, had a few good tokes and now I'm ruined. I don't know. I don't know, you know. But, um. <laughs> and, and obviously we lose our moral authority. Um, basically, what she just said is she's toking on the Holy Ghost. She's toking. I'm going to say that again to you. She's toking on the Holy Ghost. Does anybody remember the video of Kenneth Hagin's uh, laughing revival when they had just one dose of the Holy Ghost? She is high. She is mocking the Holy Ghost. That's what charismatics do best. They're really good at it. And then when they have got with, when they have Stash Man here, Stash Man over to the right here, Stat Dr. Stash Man is the apologist for them, and Dr. Stashman tries to give them the cover. In the eyes of the world, because they look at us as hypocrites. And I think so often we say, this can't be God, this is, you know, this is wrong, it can't be God, you know, you know, it looks like a drug thing, and you're teaching the body how to use drugs. And, <laughs> and so you got to listen. you got to listen carefully to that kind of opposition. And then take a little toke, and then give an answer. <laughs> Why don't you breathe right into that place? Right into that place. Bring in the ghost. Ah! <laughs> An overdose in kingdom stuff is really good. <laughs> so while the apostles were running around, uh, losing their heads, getting beaten, um, they were being persecuted. They were being martyred for the faith, uh, whipped, thrown in prison, uh, all that. These guys sit around and this absolute Jezebel, right, is running around. And what is she doing? She's toking on the Holy Ghost. And, and obviously we lose our moral authority in the eyes of the world because they look at us as hypocrites. You can breathe it in, but you can also mainline it whoa whoa inside your hand is god's hand your spirit man feels who you are there's a spirit man hand inside of your natural hand okay so i think she's high too because nobody's that much of an idiot without drugs so is it a euphoric high from devils yes I actually believe that, yes. I, I don't believe she's faking. I believe she is literally possessed by devils, and, and 
She, I used to say they're snorting devils. Well, now they're smoking them. I believe she is smoking devils. That's exactly what she's doing. Sucking them all in. Absolutely. And somebody said, what if somebody thinks she's a real Christian? That's what my point is. That's why I do what I do. That's why I talk about these people. Because millions upon millions of them are insane. And you know what? And they're, and people are following them. You know what I think is really funny is when people try to be like, oh, what's the point? Why do you do this? Why do you talk about all this stuff? It's no big deal. There's only millions of people going to hell because they're following this deceived nonsense. Why don't you just go back to your hole, preacher? Go find a hole and sit there, will ya? And stop warning us. We want to be asleep. Don't tell people about this. Right? To which what I say when women and, and people like that say that to me, I just look at them and say, get behind me, Satan. Because the only one that wants to shut me up and keep me quiet is the devil. And a bunch of Jezebels that follow him. Yep. Mm-hmm. When I see more men following these, these dyke-looking women like this right here, an absolute dyke-looking female, butch to the core, an absolute butch female. Yep. Do you know how many men in Minnesota walk up to me and I tell them I'm a pastor, I'll give them a gospel tract, or I'll tell them about the Lord, or I'll tell them... I I pastor a church and and um, things like that, and we'll get in a conversation about the Lord, and they're like, you know what? My, my pastor's a lot like that. She always goes and visits people. I'm like, huh? She's always out there doing this. I'm like, Do you understand how many effeminate men walk around Minnesota and they go into churches? They go into churches, right? With effeminate or uh, with masculine women ruling over them. Right? And you must never forget about that guy. Whenever you start bringing up topics like that, that guy is coming to see you. That guy right there. That guy right there. The, 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 the embodiment of effeminate Minnesota men. That guy right there. There he is. That guy. Whenever, whenever you think you're, whenever you think you're going to get past the broadcast when talking about stuff like that, what happens? That guy shows up and he's there and he says, Hey, what are you doing? Mr. Baptist man, what are you doing? And that guy says, hast thou found me? Oh, mine enemy. And I look at him and I say, I have found thee. And that Jezebel wife of yours. <laughs> that guy. Nobody can forget about him, can they? That guy right there. Mm-hmm. You know it, Joe McDonald. You can't forget about that guy, can you? So, back to Dr. Michael Brown and Patricia King. Dr. Michael Brown. Dr. Michael Brown, the apostate apologist for the charismatic, toke-smoking people. 
charismatic witches. That is full of the greater glory of God. And now turn to your neighbor and give them an injection. <laughs> She's talking about giving them an injection, you know, like heroin, like you shoot heroin up. She's talking about giving them an injection of the blood of Christ. See, some of you don't understand why John MacArthur got so irately ticked off at these people in the 70s and why he came out against this stuff and probably on some areas went too, well, did go too far in my opinion, uh, in some of those areas when it comes to the blood of Christ. These are the, pe these are the reasons why he did it. These people angered him so much because of their absolute nonsense. So she's using a drug term, one, one toke over the line. Remember that song? Some of you don't know it, thank God. I mean, this is this is the group um, Brewer and Shipley. They have a song, One Toke Over the Line, Sweet Jesus, One Toke Over the Line, Sitting Downtown in a Railway Station, One Toke Over the Line. Well, that's what she's equating it to. Right? That's One Toke Over the Line. blasphemers, mockers of God, mockers of the work of the Holy Ghost. But they say, they say, these charismatics say, well, you're mocking the Holy Ghost and you're, because you're denying the work of the Spirit. Look, you little leather tongue Jezebels. I'm not denying the work of the Spirit. I'm denying your blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. I'm denying your absolute blasphemy of the gifts of the Spirit. They wouldn't know the power of God if it hit them upside the head. You rest assured that. They don't have any clue what the power of God is. They've never had it. What they do have is the doctrines of devils. And devils make them famous and make them rich. And by the way, you know what I think is funny? Pentecostal women that come on here and defend this Pentecostal nonsense. Well, why? Well, they have to. That's their mama. The whole movement was started by women. The whole movement was started by Jezebel, and they all have that spirit of Jezebel in them. And they all oppose the truth. And they don't like male leadership. They hate men. And what you have to understand is, I, I, I want you to, I'm going to help you with something. When you Jezebels come on here and you Jeze and, and you write me and you send me letters and, or uh, write me and send me things and, and, uh, and get mad at me and emails and all kinds of stuff. And you get angry with me and you put comments on it and all that stuff. You don't understand when you do that. It's like, you're just saying sick them because I, it, it just, it's fuel. It's fuel for me to fight that even more. It's fuel for me to fight that charismatic spirit even more. Because I'm firmly convinced that the majority of Pentecostals and charismatics don't know the gospel, period. I don't believe they know what the gospel is. I absolutely do not believe they know what the gospel is. Get your 
anointed injector fingers. Greater is he. Do you think it's amazing that somebody actually sat for an hour or two hours and listened to this blithering idiot talk? Okay, let me, let me explain something to you. I used to be a druggie. I smoked pounds of pot. Pounds of it. I'm not bragging. I'm not happy. I'm glad. I thank God Jesus saved me from it. And as a pothead, if you would have told me that these people were of the Lord, I would have looked at you higher than a kite and said, you're insane. Because there is no way in the world that thing is of God. He that is in you than he that is in the world and give them a big injection. Every single one of them, give them a big injection. You that are watching by internet, bzz, 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 I give you a big injection. You ain't giving me nothing, lady. No way. Nothing at all. I don't want nothing you're injected with. You got some devils. Reminds me of that, uh, what's her name? Uh, Heidi. Legacy, 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 legacy. Fire, 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 legacy, legacy. Of the blood of Christ. And, and obviously we lose our moral authority in the eyes of the world because they look at us as hypocrites. How can anybody think that Dr. Michael Brown has a leg to stand on? Heidi Baker, that's it. Thank you. How could anybody think that that... Because see, uh, Satan is using Michael Brown. He's using him to give cover to all these people. Absolutely. I believe that 100%. But that's exactly what's going on. Let me see if this is the right one I'm looking for. Wow. When you put in uh, Patricia King right now on um, YouTube, it's the second video. Mine is. That's hilarious. <laughs> Good. That's awesome. Anyway, uh, let's see. That's not the one I'm looking for. Is it this one? Oh, yeah. So... As we're going to continue to talk about that, um, and I think this is it. I don't think there, yeah, there wasn't anything else I wanted to cover with that one there. Okay, but I am going to show you another one here. This will pretty much prove to you that this lady's a witch. Now, you have to understand, most of her videos, this one doesn't, by the way, but most of her videos... Most of them have hundreds of thousands, a lot of them have hundreds of thousands of hits. Okay? So they have a lot of hits. Let me see here what this one is. Oh, this one I'm going to save for last. Maybe it's this one. Nope, oh, that's that one. Have that one already. This is the one. So this is like a playlist here of just, and we're going to talk about this, how to open heavenly portals. She's teaching people how to open heavenly portals. Um, uh, here's some, okay. Uh, on discerning angels, angels with special deliveries. Defeating Jezebel. So a Jezebel writing about defeating Jezebel. That's nice. Look at the one eye there. 
an assignment for profits. Whatever you focus on, whatever you focus on, you empower. What does that even mean? Doesn't matter. They just make stuff up as they go. That's what charismatics do. That's what they do. They make stuff up as they go. As the devils give them utterance, right? Now, we've, we've looked at this verse many times, but we should continue to look at this verse. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. See, here's what charismatics do in Pentecostals. What Pentecostals and Charismatics do is they try to make you believe what they're doing are the same gifts that are in the Bible. Hang on one second. I'm going to turn the air on here. Oh, it's going to freeze me out. That's what's going to happen next. It's going to freeze me. Carl, I think the next pastor of your church is going to be Patricia King. And she's going to give you the anointing. Well, that's not true. You don't only follow Jesus. You follow Jesus in the sense that in, in the word of God that, that he is over you. And he is the final authority. But the Bible says that we follow men. We follow uh, men as they follow Christ. Churches have leaders for a reason. God has an order for a reason. God has the office of a bishop for a reason. God has the church, the local New Testament church, for a reason. The Bible says the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. There's a reason and a purpose that God has, and God has instructions for the office of a bishop for a reason. So to say that I'll never follow a man means that means that, that you're not that you're not willing to submit to God's authority at all. Because God puts authority in, puts them in. Just had an old friend of mine stop by taking, talking to me because I don't hold Sabbath Saturday. I believe it's the first day of the week. I didn't say anything badly to her about it, her beliefs on it. Well, I'll tell you something, um, Andrea. Uh, those people, when people are consumed, it is a satanic consumption. Okay? So when somebody is taken with a false doctrine and they hold the Sabbath, uh, and they, they, they use it as a law against God's people, the reason why is it's, it's and it gets a hold of them. And they won't shake it like that. Um, it's because they're consumed. That's why. So, I mean... That's why, Andrea, pray for her, because that's the only thing that can break that, is God dealing with her heart. When people, uh, uh, let me show you that, okay? I wasn't planning on doing this, but you're my friend, so I'm going to show you, all right?
Let me show you something here real quick. Uh, let's see. Hang on a second. My computer's acting funny here. Galatians 3.1. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So in other words, when somebody gets to that point, okay, when somebody gets uh, to that point, um, they're bewitched. They're subverted, the Bible says, right? Here's what the Bible says about that. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. They end up being subverted. And there's nothing that can be done. But after you've showed them, then to let them go. Because they won't listen. At all. There were no Pentecostals back then. The Pentecostal movement was started. It's a defunct movement that was started. There were no Pentecostals a hundred years over a hundred years ago. Nobody that followed that, besides some some spurious mystics here and there. Hang on, I got to... In Jesus Christ, you have access into the heavens and you can actually receive downloads out of the heavens. Jesus uh, taught us to pray, our Father who lives in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So we... So, in other words, basically what this woman is saying to you is that you can receive direct downloads from God and visions and all these other things from God. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, Pastor, does the Bible say it's wrong to worship the Lord in any day of the week? No, you should worship God every day of the week, but you're not allowed to make it a law saying if you don't do it, then you're going to hell. Or if you don't worship, uh, if you don't, um, if you go to church on Sunday, that's the that's the uh, that's the mark of the beast. You don't get to add to Scripture. You should worship every the Lord every day. We can have a connection to that heavenly glory. So I want to help you today to understand how you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, can open up heavenly portals. That means an opening from the heavenlies down into your life, over your life, and into places in the earth. Uh, uh, heaven so basically, now, now that you've heard that, and, and I'm going to explain this to you. She's talking about opening up doorways. Okay, I have the Holy Ghost in my soul. Okay? I was saved by the grace of God. My sins were forgiven me by Jesus Christ. He saved me and he washed me in his own blood. And he made me a new creature. He gave me his spirit. The earnest of the spirit. 
That was the down payment promise that Jesus would take me to heaven one day. That is the down payment promise. The Holy Ghost is our earnest. He is our down payment until the redemption of all things. So in other words, basically, the Holy Ghost of God is given to me as a promise of the Father. And he seals me under the day of redemption. I don't need to open portals to heaven or doorways to heaven. We have one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I have all the access to God that I'm ever going to get through the indwelling of the Holy Ghost of God. So what this woman is teaching you is something completely opposite. She wants you to open portals to devils. She wants you to open the doors of perception. Do you understand? She's talking about doorways and doors of perception. You know, like break on through to the other side. You know, like riders on the storm. They're witches. And you're going to see how this witch takes the Bible and turns it into a, and tries to attempt to turn it into a book of witchcraft, of practicing a craft. That's what she's doing with it. She's turning it into some kind of Harry Potter novel. And Dr. Mustache Man, Michael there, gives her cover. And their ministry's cover to do it. Because he tries to make himself look like a sane person. Well, let's be real here, Michael. Doc. Your roots come from the Brownsville Revival, which I will get to today, which was wholly wicked anyway and full of a bunch of nonsense. I don't need your witchy garbage. I have the book. I have the Holy Ghost. I have the promise of God. I don't need portals open to heaven. Heavenly portal is actually just a window, it could be a door, an opening into God's realm, into his eternal realm, into the heavenly dimension. And in Christ, you can live under an open heaven because he opened the way for you. So we're going to review some scriptures that are going to bring some confirmation to this because you always want what you hear to be followed up and confirmed by the word of God. The first scripture that we're going to look at is Deuteronomy 28, 12. And it says, the Lord will open for you his good storehouse, the heavens. He's going to open the place of the heavens and give rain to your land. Oftentimes rain in the scripture is in reference to blessings and to bless all the work of your hand and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. So how would you like to live under an open heaven that God has opened for you in, in Christ? It's all open and blessings are pouring down to a point where you never need to borrow. You will be the lender. Right, so you're never going to, if you just follow this, if you follow if you follow my spell, if you follow my formula, then windows of heaven are going to open and you're going to be rich and you're never going to have to borrow anything. Think about that. And not the borrower. It's awesome. In Matthew 3, 16, we see that after Jesus was baptized, he immediately came up out of the water and behold, the heavens were open. Two now, here's where she gets into some blasphemy right here and false doctrine. 2,000 years ago, Jesus opened the heavens. In Deuteronomy 28, which we just read, that is 
a, an open heaven for everyone who, who obeyed all the commandments. Well, no human being except for Jesus has done that. So in Matthew 3, we see the fulfillment that Jesus fulfilling all righteousness and especially taking the waters of baptism, which meant that he repented on behalf of all mankind's sin. He Stop. She said that Jesus, his baptism represented him repenting for all man's sins. No, the Bible says that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he tasted death for all men. He died for all men's sins. It's absolutely heretical what she just said. But that, don't get me wrong, that's what Pentecostals and Charismatics specialize in. They specialize in heresy. They have a PhD in it. They have an honorary doctorate from the devil. It's a triple D, D, D. They get, it, they get the 3D from the devil. A 3D degree, doctorate degree from the devil. That they, 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 get, they are heretics to the core. He came up out of the water and the heavens were open and he saw the spirit of God descending upon him saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the heaven actually opened over you as a believer 2000 years ago. If it's over Jesus and Jesus is in you, then it's open over you. Okay. So she said that, well, Jesus opened a portal when he got baptized, he opened a portal. So because Jesus opened the portals of heaven, now your portal, now you have a portal open too. Totally made that up out of, uh, totally, totally counterfeited scripture. A total counterfeit of the word of God. This is what you call the great spin. Taking something that actually happened, Jesus being baptized, Jesus being our example, the Father recognizing Jesus' baptism, and honoring it, and she totally changes it into something wicked. That's what Satan does. And marvel not, the Bible says. Satan comes as an angel of light. What they do. And by the way, it's so many times women. When the Bible warns us about women, warns us about women being, in fact, false doctrine, false doctrine is likened to a whorish woman, a strange woman, the woman that rides the beast. Why? Well, because of the fall of Eve. It's always likened unto a woman. So many times. Right? It's likened unto a woman. And that's what's here. Another one we read is out of John 1, 51. And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So angels are coming out of heaven upon Jesus and then rising up again and ascending into heaven from Jesus. So again, if he is in you, that open portal is over you because of the spirit of Christ who is in you. This is not for people who don't have Jesus as their personal savior. This is for those who have Jesus living in their hearts. And then She goes to her belly to describe her heart. That's kind of weird, but anyway, okay. Um, so she's talking about, you have a portal, you have portals. Jesus opened portals for you. No Bible for it, none whatsoever, no Bible for it at all, but that's what she teaches.
because that's what witches do. They open up a Bible, they talk about Bible verses, and then they swerve it to be completely something else. And then in Acts 7, 55 to 56, we see with Stephen, it says, but being full of the Spirit, Stephen gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. Now, this is in the midst of Stephen was being martyred. But in the midst of that, he sees this portal open and Jesus is standing at the right hand of, of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And so when, when Stephen died, it said that he had this glow on him that people thought he was an angel. And that's because he was inside of a portal. He didn't suffer. He didn't, you know, feel the kind of pain. Where does the Bible say that Stephen was inside of a portal? Where does the Bible say that Stephen, when he was, when he was murdered, was inside of a portal? Let's see here. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. When they heard these, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed it with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Nowhere at all. Does it say that? She made it up. Pain that we would think one would feel because he was under that portal. He was gazing upon Jesus. He saw into that realm and had that portal opened around him. And then in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. So this lady is telling you, you should seek portals. I'm just curious. There's, there's only, let's see, there's 46 people on YouTube right now. There is... Two people on, on um, Rumble right now. There is 10 total people and six that are on there. So, I don't know, 60 people, let's say. Out of the 60 people that are on here, you that are able to chat... How many of you believe that God wants you to pray to have portals open for you to heaven? How many of you see in the scriptures that God wants portals open for you? Anybody? Anybody think that any way at all? How about Pentecostals and Charismatics, if there's any listening to me that get angry at me? How many think that they're supposed to be monkeying around with portals? I think I'm supposed to have portals open. Okay, so out of 50 Bible believers, it seems like to me most people are like, where are they getting this at? Where are they getting it from? Where's the discernment? Terrible. But yet Dr. Michael Brown gives this woman cover. Oh, well, he doesn't agree with everything. Uh, this is a pretty serious. These are pretty serious things.
It says, bring the whole tithe, that's 10% of everything that comes into our hands, into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. So we see that for those who give God the first and the best, honor him with the tithe and the offerings, that God himself will open the windows or the portals of heaven and pour out a blessing that we can't even contain. And then See, so if you tithe, God's going to open portals for you, right? If you just, I mean, if you tithe, God will open some portals for you. Who believes that? But see, she took one truth of that God blesses giving, and he does. I believe that. I believe God. I believe God blesses giving. I absolutely believe that. I believe that if you give to the first fruits and, and, and to the Lord's ministries and to the Lord's churches, I believe you'll be blessed. Sure, why not? It's in the Bible. What does that have to do with opening portals? Nothing. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves those that, that, that have a giving heart that want to help others. But it has nothing to do with what she just said. At all, period. Let's look at one more out of Revelation 4, 1. It says, after these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. So this is John, and he's all of a sudden seeing a door open in heaven. Well, we know Jesus is the door. And the first voice which he heard, like the sound of a trumpet, was saying, come up here, and I'll show you things to come. And so we have access to the heavenlies. We have access to living under an open heaven all the time, 24 seven, you can live under it. If Jesus is in you, he is the way, he is the door, he is the life, he is the one who has opened the heaven, he lives in you, all that activity is based on his presence on the inside of you. Now, uh, Ruth Heflin, Ruth Ward Heflin um, was an evangelist, a revivalist many years ago. And so where does the Bible say that a woman is supposed to be an evangelist and a revivalist? Where do we find the uh, scriptural qualifications of a revivalist or a a uh, a revivalist or an evangelist, a female? When did Jesus ever ordain one? When did the apostles ever ordain one? When were they ever commanded to preach in mixed co mixed company? And to hold those meetings. Where was that ever at? Where was that found in the scriptures? It's not. They're a bunch of usurpers is what they are. It's a way for feminist. It's a way for feminist. And man haters. To usurp authority and try to act like they have. Biblical mandate to do it. Never seen the office of a revivalist. Never seen that. Never seen where God called women to do any of those things. And that's why Pentecostal women hate Baptists. Baptists that follow the book, they absolutely hate them. They absolutely hate them. When a bat, because because nowhere in the scriptures is this grand prophet woman that's going to teach you how to unlock the mysteries and open the doors of perception and unlock spiritual portals. Sounds like a witch. Sounds like a witch.
And she had a lot of glory going on in, in, in her meetings. I mean, there would be miracle signs and wonders all the time. And, and you know, the, the presence of God was tangible and thick. There would be feathers falling, oil pouring out, gold. So where in the Bible does it say that feathers are supposed to fall from heaven when I preach and gold dust is supposed to come out? Last time I checked, gold dust was some gay wrestler. Okay, so what in the world, where in the Bible does it say, well, when you preach, I mean, a, a real move of God is when feathers fall from heaven. So if I was in a meeting and, a, and somebody was preaching, and feathers fell from heaven, I would leave. I would leave. If gold dust and silver dust was falling from heaven, I would leave. That's what I would do. I would not stick around a meeting like that. If feathers were falling from heaven, I'd be out of there. If gold dust was falling from heaven, see ya. Because one day lightning's going to fall from heaven. And the fifth angel sounded and a star fall from heaven. I saw a star fall from heaven under the earth and it was given, it was in it and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Right? I'm leaving. Right? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you leave? I'd be getting out of there. I wouldn't be sticking around. It's kind of dangerous, don't you think? A little dangerous, isn't it? To be messing around with? I would think so. But these people don't think so. These people believe that it's it's right for them to, to that, that these are signs of God. That God is working in that. I'm trying to find it for you. Oh, there it is. I think I found it right here. Here we go. And he's telling him about these, these encounters with Bigfoot that he's having. The Nephilim, 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 Nephilim. And I lifted up my sword. Crazy. And I was like, Ksh, and he was like, Ksh, and I was like, <laughs> I'm getting my shotgun. I'm getting my 45. Ted, spiritual warfare. <laughs> Give me my gun. Give me my 50 cal. Give me my, my Uzi, whatever I got. Just give me something. And I'm blowing these things away. The okay. Brain. So you aimed your prayer. What are you like? A prayer? You got a prayer bazooka? You got a prayer <laughs> missile? I aimed. It 
waged strong spiritual warfare. I aimed my prayers at that side. Boom, and I fired. This sounds like intense spiritual warfare. He did spiritual warfare. Prayer and, 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 and strong spiritual warfare, I guess. Whatever that is. Those are the key words. Strong spiritual warfare. I'm going to take my guns, and I'm going to get my car, and I'm going to go home. I'm going home. I'm not sitting in the woods with a bunch of whatever they are. And we did strong spiritual warfare. Strong spiritual warfare. Yeah, and yeah. I did strong warfare. Because we're in strong spiritual warfare. Go <laughs> home. If there was some Bigfoot crazy psychotic devilish creature out there that was growling and grunting and backmasking Led Zeppelin songs to me all night. I, I'm not going to sleep, bro. No way, I, dude. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm not sleeping with that thing there. We both did intense spiritual warfare. And I saw golden roosters. When Bigfoot didn't touch me and left me alone, and I did strong spiritual warfare. Bigfoot ran. It, the struggle is real. That's the truth, man. They won't be hairy. They won't stink. Intense spiritual, spiritual warfare. warfare. <laughs> glory in the upper bowl, and he shoots the glory at him. And glory in the lower bowl, and he whoops. Tie you can. <laughs> This Bigfoot was talking to my mind telepathically. Okay, that it was in a biological container. What are hoops? Like, whoop, whoop. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> oh, too much fun. I once rode in a van with one. That's true, you did. You did glitter, Aaron. you know, silver glitter, all kinds of, you know, fragrances and that as they would worship the Lord. And she had coined a phrase. It was praise until the spirit of worship comes, worship until the glory comes and then stand in the glory. And so she and this is the first uh, key I'm going to give you is that she would open the heavens through praise and worship. OK, so. So I don't know if you realize this or not, if you just if you. The, these people are such witches. They are such witches. I, oh, I can't stand them so much. If you just, if you, if you praise and worship and you work up the crowd, it's almost like, you know what it reminds you of? It reminds you of, of Hulkamania. That's what it reminds you of. Okay. Cause what, when I, when I watched wrestling, when I was a kid and when, when, when Hulk Hogan did the fish face, it was over. I mean, you could hit him in the head. With a steel pole. You could hit him in the head with a crowbar. And he was like. They, they, you just worked it up. I mean, he just got worked up. Or like the ultimate warrior. When he came out running and he came out. And he's like this. And you just, you just have to work it up enough. If you can work it up enough. If you can work it all up enough. Then you'll open the portals of heaven. Right? It's it's sort of like if you have the ruby red slippers and you click your heels three times and you say, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. If you do that three times, then you're going to go home because you have the ruby red slippers. You're going to open that portal. If you do this enough, you'll activate God. It's like God's a transformer that's offline and you got to activate him. Right? You got to you got to activate you got to activate God. You know, so so if you do the right things, you'll activate God. It's like transformers, transform and roll out. See? That's what you got to do. And then you just stand in the glory and dust comes falling from the sky. Gold dust and silver dust and, and feathers. I mean, what's wrong with you people? Like, why do you have a problem with that anyway? 
What's wrong with you? Why would anybody have a problem with feathers falling from the sky? I mean, what's your problem? I mean, you're sitting there in a preaching meeting, and all of a sudden, you got gold dust falling. Well, what is this, in an episode of WrestleMania? She would open that portal, and I've seen that even in our own services at Shiloh. Um, we'll be in worship and worshiping the Lord, focusing in, in on Him, and all of a sudden I can feel a portal open, an invitation for an open portal where the glory can begin to move within the room. And some so I, when when you get there, and it's like I can feel the invitation of the portal opening uh what are you like stargate what 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 have you been watching bad episodes of star trek what are you looking for the force luke what's the matter with you anyway none of that sounds biblical at all Sometimes I'll be led to direct a prophetic word or a word of knowledge or direct something in prayer or to highlight a certain aspect of the service. Sure. But I have, I have looked at it. Every time I do that, it opens up something in the corporate meeting that brings a greater blessing into the meeting. So first of all, you're leading a group of uh, a, a mixed group, a mixed multitude against the scriptures. But you Pentecostal charismatic nut job women want me to believe that God Almighty is using you when you're in direct rebellion to God's order. You want me to believe that God is using you. Not a chance. You want me to believe as you have a woman stand up and lead you. Right? So you Pentecostal women, you remember one thing. You charismatic women, you remember one thing. And you men that follow them. You effeminate men that follow them. Remember this one thing. They're in rebellion to God by doing what they're doing. And you are too. So everything that comes from them is not of God. Mm -hmm. It's not of God. What they're doing is not biblical. That's right. Rebellion is the spirit of witchcraft. That's exactly what it is. It's witchcraft that it's highest. By the way, why do you think charismania is so popular in America? Why do you think it's so popular? Why do you think they're so wealthy? Why do you think people love them so much? Why? I'll tell you why. Because women... Women absolutely go gaga over signs and wonders and feelings and spiritual impartation, 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 legacy, legacy. Imp they go gaga over it because they love the attention. And because of their sensory receptors, they absolutely love it. And because of the intuition and the desire for knowledge, they love it. That's why the whole movement's there. I would walk away from the Pentecostal charismatic movement for one reason and one reason only to begin with. Number one, the number one reason. Founded and led by women. Just like I would the Seventh-day Adventism. 
founded by a woman would have nothing to do with them. Any of those groups. Why? Because they're founded by women. Bobbed haired, bossy wives. That's why. And let me say this very plainly to you. If you're a woman and you can grow your hair long and you won't, well, you're in rebellion to God, period. You're just in rebellion to God. Now, some women can't. There's nothing they can do about it. That's understandable. Makes perfect sense. You can only do what God allows you to do. But women that can and don't, it's because they, they want to be like a man. And what's actually happening is that angels are being dispatched, the presence of the Lord is intensifying, and the corporate body is getting connected to what God's wanting to pour out from heaven in that particular moment. And I can feel portals open and I can feel when they close as well. Oh. And so sometimes you have to operate within that. So I can feel when they close and when they open. Ah, so where do you find that in the scriptures? That I'm supposed to feel when the portals open and close and, you know, I can feel it. I can, I can, I can feel it. Because it's your faith. I am going to run out of time. I got to get moving. And your focus, your praise, the atmosphere that you are opening that actually opens it there. So you have to learn how to work with those uh, portals once they open so that you can see it, um, see, see it remain. So praise and worship is one key. And even in your own personal devotion times, I've had times when I just in my own personal devotion, I'm praising God and, and, and just boasting on who he is and what he's done. And all of a sudden I could feel the glory presence of God come into the room. It was like this divine connection into the heavens that would take place. And so that often happens. And then in that place, there's often revelation, uh, prophetic revelation, insight, or a word, a message from God will come when that portal opens. Another way. So, um, hey, guess what, guys? So a message will come when the portal is open. Whoa. Wait a minute. I thought we have a more sure word of prophecy. I thought that I get my message from here, from this Bible, from this book, from God's holy word. This is God's divine revelation to man. You bunch of nasty, filthy, dirty witches. You want me to ignore God's word and jump aboard your nasty, filthy, disgusting visions and your downloaded garbage from your portals of hell. And you want me to ignore God's holy word and you want me to seek after signs and wonders and everything else. And I'm going to tell you something. Some of you people that call yourselves Pentecostals and Charismatics, you don't want the word of God. You want some other word because this book ain't good enough for you. You don't feast on God's word. You're looking for signs and wonders and feelings and everything else. And it's filthy and abominable is what it is. Absolutely filthy and abominable. Somebody said, ought we to call names at unbelievers? Who's we? You got a turd in your pocket? This is the word of God. This is God's holy word. Whoops. Let me go back here. 
Spain. So praise and worship is one. See, these people want you, these witches want you to get off this book. They don't want you talking about this book. No. Nope. Why is that? Well, because they want you to seek signs and wonders from somewhere else. That's what they want. They want signs and wonders. Somebody said they don't do that at our church. I know they don't talk about Jezebels and witches at your church. Probably they probably don't deal with satanic opposition. Uh, they don't deal with people that Jesus called uh, beware of the, or Paul said, beware of dogs, beware of the concision. When Herod came after him, he said, go tell that Fox Herod. Jesus said, you vipers, you generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Often happens, and then in that place, there's often revelation, uh, prophetic revelation, insight, or a word, a message from God will come. And in Matthew 28, verse 18, he says, all authority in the heavens and the earth has been given unto me. And so there's authority in that name. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father in the heavens. So when you call on his name and reverence his name and use his name, it is. So they want to use Jesus's name like some magic talisman. If you use Jesus's name, you're going to open portals up into heaven. Okay, so here's what here's what she's saying. What the Bible says is that Jesus represents authority. The na in the name of Jesus means authority, not like the charismatics do it like Kenneth Copeland. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. No, that's a that's a blasphemous little devil is what that is. That's who that is. That's, that's what that is. They're using, using Jesus' name like some kind of talisman. Jesus' name is according to the will of God. That's what that means. When I use the authority, it's the authority of God. It's the will of God. It is, it, is, it is giving you power of attorney and his power from heaven will come upon you. I've seen that happen many times where even calling upon the name of the Lord, all of a sudden a deliverance portal will open up and free. Oh, will that's that's a new a new portal. A deliverance portal will open up. Did you know that 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 if you say it right, if you say Jesus's name right, uh, a deliverance portal will open up. Oh, Okay. Will come, and another thing that can open up the portal is, of course, the Word of God, because the Word is eternal. In oh, and the last thing that'll open it up is God's Word. I mean, that's the last thing. I mean, it wouldn't be the first thing; it'd be be the last thing. In the heavens, and it and it and it's a light unto our path. It makes a way for us when we proclaim the word. It it, it causes light, and that light comes from the glory presence of God. And the word that is Jesus Christ is released. It connects to the word that you are decreeing. So oftentimes, when I'm doing decrees of the word of God, and we've got lots of decrees on my ministry site, just go to Patricia King. Oh, and then if you just decree things, you would understand. I. By the way, when you go to her website, she has decrees for children to make. For you to be in the glory of God. And then one more that I'll give you today is, is tongues, is the gift of tongues that I've been oh, so there prompted it is. by the Spirit to pray in tongues furiously and much in these last few, few days or so, well, actually a few weeks now. And I just want to encourage you to pray in tongues much because you don't know what you're praying in your understanding, but the Bible says that when you're praying in tongues, when you're speaking tongues, you're actually releasing the mysteries. You're speaking the mysteries of heaven. You are connecting to that 
to that realm of the eternal glory that isn't in the mind of man yet. It's, it's the spirit connects to that realm. So when you're praying in tongues, oftentimes I felt after a season of praying in tongues, like especially after an hour or so, all of a sudden I feel a realm opened up. So an hour of praying in tongues, not praying for lost people to be saved, not praying for forgiveness of sins, not praying for your family, not praying for the needs of others, not praying for your country, not praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ, not praying for, nope, I'm just praying in tongues. I have no idea what I'm saying. I'm just flipping my tongue at 400 miles an hour saying absolutely nothing. And I'm surprised that I'm strumming up devils and portals. Sure. Why wouldn't you open up some portals? Sure you would. Why wouldn't you open up portals? And I can get fresh revelation from God. Sometimes uh, miracles can happen. Yeah, so let me get this straight. So God's given this woman through tongues who's in direct rebellion to God, who pastors a church in direct abel uh, rebellion to God, right? Who's at a Jezebel completely out of the will of God, and God is giving her things through flapping her tongue. For hours on end. Right. Yeah, you know what you're getting? Strong delusion. That's what you're getting. You want that, so God will let you have that. If someone wants that strong delusion, God will give them over to their delusions. Fine, if that's what you want, you can have it. And that, especially in a corporate prayer meeting, when, when uh, that that is happening. A spirit of faith will come and fill you. This is what can happen during, um, during times when the portal is open. Okay, so um, those are some helps for you, but I've got a course called the Glory School, and it, was, it, it came out of a 30-day visitation of the Holy Spirit, and I would love... Okay, so she had a 30-day visitation of the Holy Ghost. So he just, Holy Ghost showed up and just visited with him for, thir visited with her for 30 days. Really? Ah. So in that 30 days, like Joseph Smith, he gave me a course. All these people say, I got something from God that's totally opposite from the scriptures, but I got it from God. And it's because God came and visited me in the spirit. You don't need that old Bible book over there. You don't need that. I got a visitation from God. I got a word of knowledge. I got a word of knowledge. I got a word of knowledge. Sure you do. For you to, to engage in that school because it'll teach you the foundations from the word of God all the way to ask how to ascend, how to descend, how to um, have an angelic activity. And go to patriciakinginstitute.com, and we have many courses there. We have courses on how to... Okay. Now, um, Doctrinal Watchdog did a... He linked together uh, by Justin Peters a video, and Justin Peters did an excellent job with this. And, you know, I wouldn't agree with Justin Peters on everything, but I do definitely agree with him on what he's saying about the charismatic movement um, and how he defines uh, what they're doing and everything else. Uh, and he talks about Dr. Michael Brown in here and the connection between the two, um, between... Uh, between the, the charismatic movement, right? And Dr. Michael Brown running cover for them. Well, Justin Peters came out and said, look, you can't run cover for these people. Here's what he says. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that this finds you and yours doing well, and I want to thank you for joining me. 
Yesterday, I received an email from Dr. Michael Brown, and in this email, he uh, he's, he gave me a little excerpt, video excerpt from one of his recent programs, uh, in the line of fire, in which he extended to me an invitation to have a public discussion with him about divine physical healing. He noted that he has offered to debate me before in years past on uh, the continuance or lack thereof of the apostolic gifts, the sign gifts. Of course, Dr. Michael Brown is a charismatic and he believes that all of these gifts continue. I, as a cessationist, believe that the apostolic gifts, and only the apostolic gifts, by the way, have, have ceased. Tongues, interpretation of tongues, miracles, and physical healing. Uh, and, and he rightly said that I've declined that invitation. And, and I did. And I, and I did so for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that that debate has been done. He's already had that debate uh, with Dr. James White. And so I didn't really see much point in going over that again. Uh, we have very different views on that issue, but he's had that debate before. But as best I understand it, uh, this new invitation is not a debate. Uh, I think he wants to have a, a discussion about physical healing. So he extended this invitation to me publicly on his program in the line of fire and also on Twitter, which I find a little bit ironic because he has blocked me on Twitter. As best I understand it, uh, he's blocked me from uh, because of what some others have said in my defense that he took issue with, I guess, but as uh, I don't think really what I have said myself, as best I understand it. But uh, at any rate, I did find it a little bit odd that he put this uh, uh, invitation to me up on Twitter when I'm blocked from his Twitter, but let me, I do have a screenshot of it and someone sent to me. So uh, let me read this to you. In his tweet, he says, here's my practical appeal to Justin Peters. Let's discuss the question of divine healing together in a public setting from a pastoral and biblical perspective. Why not? Well, uh, Dr. Brown, I'm going to have to respectfully decline your offer to do this. And the primary reason for declining your offer is that one word that you yourself used, pastoral. The Bible, as you know, gives a number of qualifications for elders or pastors. Among them found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is that elders or pastors are to be above reproach they are to be temperate, they are to be respectable, and they are to be able to teach sound doctrine. Also in chapter three, we see that a, an elder uh, must not be a new convert. Now, I don't think Paul primarily has in mind a time frame there when he talks about a new convert, though within uh, certain you know reasonable limitations, of course, you wouldn't want someone who's been converted for a day, being an elder in a church, obviously. But I think what he primarily has in view there, um, not so much a time frame, but rather spiritual maturity. And the reason, one of the reasons that I say this is because we actually see in the New Testament some of the churches that Paul planted uh, within just a couple of short years, two or three years, were being led by uh, men that had been converted under his preaching when he came in and planted the church. So not so much a time frame, but rather a, a spiritual maturity. Uh, elders are not to be immature believers. And we also know from scripture that one of the marks of a mature Christian is a discerning Christian. You know, we see this in Hebrews chapter five. Uh, one cannot be a mature Christian, a mature believer in lack theological, spiritual discernment at the same time. And so uh, that is another one of the qualifications. And, and there also uh, in Titus chapter one, uh, Paul in his letter to Titus, he reiterates many of these same qualifications, uh, including being able to teach sound doctrine, as he said in first Timothy chapter three. So he reiterates that, but he adds this too, able to teach sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. And Dr. Brown, as you know, one of my chief criticisms of you is that uh, you have been unwilling to call out by name the most egregious, the most brazenly obvious false prophet. Now, now the reason I'm playing this is he's going to get into some things 
that these people that Michael Brown is a gatekeeper for these charismatics and the things that they're teaching and they have taught very dangerous, perverted things, according to the scriptures. It's heretics and charlatans in your own movement, the charismatic movement. Just a few examples of this. Uh, you have recently referred to Kenneth Copeland as your brother, your brother in Christ. Kenneth Copeland is um, obviously a false prophet. He has offered and uttered many, many false prophecies. He has uttered some of the most jaw-dropping heresies that you could even imagine, uh, just brazen, brazen heresies. And as if that were not enough, he compounds the error, not only by teaching these these blood curdling heresies, but actually ascribes God as the source of these heresies. Uh, he's guilty, of course, of teaching blatant and egregious prosperity theology. And I will say in fairness that you do, you have publicly said you do not, you do not agree with some of the more extreme teachings of prosperity, but, but nonetheless, uh, Kenneth Copeland is a false prophet by every biblical criterion of the term. If, if Kenneth Copeland is not a false prophet, then the term truly has no meaning. And, and yet you call him your brother in Christ. Uh, you also, uh, it's very well known that you are, um, um, close friends with Sid Roth. He's a close personal friend of yours. Sid Roth on his program entitled it's supernatural, uh, has just the most looney tune wing nut people on his program. I mean, just lunacy on his program. Uh, he has uh, recently had a lady on his program who claims that when she plays her violin, it's so anointed that people age in reverse. Uh, he regularly has people on his program who claim to get dreams and visions from God and uh, they shuttle back and forth to heaven. If uh, and One of the mo more shocking things that I've seen on Sid Roth's program was just last year in uh, February of 2018, and uh, Sid Roth is reenacting a tale from being told by Smith Wigglesworth's granddaughter. Now listen to this, because this is um, this is really heavy. Uh, what what Smith Wigglesworth did? A, a tale, a, a, an account that supposedly happened in Smith Wigglesworth's ministry, in which uh, Smith. Wigglesworth was presented with a baby um, by a young couple, their, their little baby who was sick. And Smith Wigglesworth claims that God told him to throw the baby, two month old baby, throw the baby against the wall and did so. And Sid Roth reenacts this. And when the baby hit the wall, it fell to the floor, of course. And then Smith Wigglesworth went up and kicked the baby like a soccer ball. Uh, this is, this is one of your friends. I mean, it, it, you, you cannot, I, I, honestly, if, if my life depended on it, I could not come up with nuttier and more disturbing claims than what is regularly paraded on Sid Roth's program. It's supernatural. Okay. So he basically, I mean, and I agree with what he's saying. Why, why would it even be worth you know, talking to somebody like that about when they're like that, right? Um, now, I'm not going to show you the whole book here because I purchased this book from David Cloud. He gives a great portion, many books away free. But, um, you know, so I, I appreciate that and I'm grateful for his ministry. That's wayoflife.org. Go buy his encyclopedia. Um, the digital version, if you like, it's like 10 bucks or the, or buy the hardback version. I don't know how much that is. Any of his books you can download, you can pay for, they're very inexpensive, but I would, I would recommend buying many of those. His history of the Pentecostal movement. This portion here is on the Brownsville revival. Dr. Michael Brown, who's the gatekeeper for people like Patricia King and other 
charismatic heretics. Um, got their founding from, he got his founding from the Brownsville Assembly of God Revival. That's where he became popular, okay? Now, here's the thing. Because of that, Uh, I want to read you the history of what went on there at the Brownsville Revival. Okay? So we get a good understanding of everything that took place. And who are these people? In January, a Pentecostal evangelist named Steve Hill was on his way back to the States for a missionary trip. Stopping over in London, he stayed with a charismatic Roman Catholic couple who opened their home for visitors. Hearing of the happenings at Holy Trinity Brompton, Hill sought out Sandy Miller and requested that he lay hands on her. When Miller acquiesced, Hill was knocked down. Six months later, on June 18th, 1995, Hill was preaching in the Brownsville Assembly of God in Pensacola when the Laughing Revival broke out. In what would become perhaps the greatest arena, its greatest arena. So, in other words, the greatest thing the greatest arena for the laughing revival. You don't see a laughing revival in the Bible. When people get close to God, they're broken over their sin. Their hearts are broken. They're brought to a broken and a contrite spirit. Oh God, thou wilt not despise. But these people in their charismatic Pentecostal revivals are yucking it up. And Michael is the same way. Dr. Michael is the same way. That's where he got to start from. Six months later, that happened. The revival was anything but spontaneous. For several weeks prior to June 18th, many members from the Brownsville Assembly of God had traveled to the Toronto Airport Vineyard Church to participate in the Laughing Revival. These participants included the worship leader, Lindell Cooley, which I don't think is related to me, by the way, and John Kilpatrick, also a film featuring the Toronto Blessing, had been shown in the Brownsville Assembly of God. Though the Pente Pen Pensacola leaders might say they disagreed with some of the things happening in Toronto, they accepted one another as co-part participants in the same Holy Spirit revival. John Arnott visited Brownsville in February of 96 and was introduced by Pastor Kilpatrick and gave a testimony to the congregation. Afterwards, Arnott laid hands on anyone who desired his ministration and was mobbed. The visit was described in a report placed on the internet by Kathy Wood, a member of Brownsville's ministry team. John Kilpatrick describes his initiation into the outpouring in June 1995. He said he fell to the floor and lay there for almost four hours. When I hit that floor... I, it felt like I weighed 10,000 pounds. I knew something supernatural was happening. Okay. What do you think? Do you think so far that sounds like something biblical? That Pastor Michael Brown, Dr. Michael Brown, excuse me, should have been a part of? Well, he was one of the ringleaders of it. Right? The following is a description by one of the church members at Brownsville Assembly. Pastor Kilpatrick was slain in the spirit for the first night and was out for several hours. For the first two weeks or so, he couldn't do anything in church. God's presence would come upon him so heavily that he couldn't move. His wife, Brenda, had been having this happen to her ever since she went up to Toronto. Several nights, people have had to drive them home and help them inside the house. And here's where they love the Baptist rub, because they love to hate Baptists. Are you ready? Even the neighbors asked what was going on. And one Baptist lady came because her interest was piqued when she kept seeing them drag past her in the house during the middle of the night. Even the last week, this happened to him again. That was an email message from Beth McDuff. McDuffie to Richard Riss, July 30th, 1995, The History of the Worldwide Awakening. Kilpatrick told of trying to drive while in the drunken condition. 
and running into garbage cans and backing into another automobile. Are you listening to this? Are you listening to this? Listen to what they're saying. What's holy about any of this? Nothing. Men in the church had to haul Kilpatrick out of the auditorium in a wheelchair because he was too drunk to walk. On one occasion, Kilpatrick fell into the plat- onto the platform and a woman from the worship team fell into his arms and they lay on the platform in a drunken stupor together. He laughingly tells his story on an audio cassette that I have. It is definitely not the Holy Spirit who causes that kind of moral temptation and confusion. Well, I'm just curious. Let's say I'm in a meeting there, right? I'm preaching a meeting and then all of a sudden, I'm drunk like that and one of the ladies in my, and I'm on the ground and one of the ladies of the church falls into my arms Dr. Michael Brown, really? 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 That's appropriate behavior? That's appropriate for a pastor? You're saying that's the Holy Ghost? That's knocking you off off your feet. That's the Holy Ghost. Well, how come that spirit's not making you holy? Spiritual drunkenness was not the only characteristic of the revival. There was also spiritual jerking. The leaders of the Pensacola meetings claimed that a turning point in the outpouring occurred in August 1995, two months after the manifestations began. A 19-year-old female college student stood and prophesied, God is in a hurry. There's not much more time. He aches and he grieves for your spirit. As she spoke these words, she was jerking so uncontrollably that she appeared to be suffering from a cerebral, cerebral palsy. When she completed this prophecy, she collapsed to the floor. Mm. One woman in the Brownsville Assembly of God Choir was allegedly healed of a serious neck injury, but for at least a year and a half afterwards, she experienced wild and uncontrollable jerking of her head from side to side whenever she was near the church. Kilpatrick said she was not ashamed, he was not ashamed to have a woman in his choir who shakes like she has palsy, claiming this was a sign from God. Services were held at the Brownsville Assembly of God four nights a week, and by January 6, 1998, there had been 2,142,571 visitors. Well, now. The, re- the laughing, what were the results of the laughing revival? The revival does not seem to have helped most of the church as it affected. In fact, the Carpenter's home church no longer exists. On a trip to Lakeland in 2000, I visited, David Cloud said, the Carpenter's home for a bit of research and was surprised to see that the massive auditorium, which seats 10,000, was almost empty. Most of the congregation was gone due to several factors. One, which is the fact that Pastor Carl Strader's son, Daniel, was in prison, having been convicted in 1995 of swindling investors, including church members. In 2005, Carpenter's Home Church sold its property to Without Walls International Church, which moved its headquarters from Tampa. By 2011, the church building uh, again sat vacant after Without Walls International husband and wife team divorced and the organization went bankrupt. In 2015, it was announced that the Carpenter's Home Church building would be demolished to make way for a retirement center. At Brownsville Assembly of God, the drunkenness and shaking are gone, and the church faces the stone-sober reality of having fewer members than before the revival came. 
Many left bitter over things that have happened. The training school that started in 96 because of the outpouring split from the church in 2001 after its leader, Michael Brown, was fired. In 2003, the worship leader, Lindale Cooley, left the church and John Kilpatrick resigned the pastorate to enter an apostolic ministry. He was replaced with the husband-wife pastor team, Randy and Susan Feldschau, followed by Evan Horton. With an attendance of only about 800 on Sunday, most pews are empty in the 2000, the 2,200-seat sanctuary, while the church's new 2,600-seat auditorium built on revival dreams is used for a gym, community classes, and storage. As for 2012, the small congregation continued to struggle to pay off the $11.5 million in debt. Church of famed Brownsville Revival struggles. Okay, well, that was all the Pensacola outpouring, right? That's the doctrines of devils. And that's what they did. That's who they are, friend. That's who they are. Michael, Dr. Michael there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say I'm supposed to detect people with familiar spirits. I'm to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I'm not to be running around being the being the person that looks for familiar spirits. I'm to preach the gospel to see people get saved. I'm to see them to walk in newness of life. I'm to teach them to whatsoever things God has commanded them. The Great Commission is very clear. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Running around chasing devils and false prophets and or de chasing devils and familiar spirits and all those things are stuff for chick comics. It's living for God day in and day out, raising my family for the Lord, training up soldiers to raise their families for the Lord, training up fathers and mothers to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Church meetings are about gathering around the word of God. Church meetings are about, about the saints of God coming together, praying together, seeking God's face together, seeing their children get saved, seeing churches started and the gospel preached all over the known world. This stuff is cartoonish. It's Satan's great distraction. It's for people to focus on signs and wonders and looking for devils around every corner as an excuse not to live for God. <coughs> you know what you need? You know what people need? They need to walk in sanctification. They need to walk in holiness. They need to walk in righteousness. They need trained how to live for God every day of their lives. They need to take this book, the King James Bible, and they need to follow the word of God. And they need a church that disciples them and teaches them how to raise their families for Jesus Christ. Every day of their life, how to face temptations, how to face trials, how to face uh, the, the wicked, strange women that are out there, how to face life and how to serve God and be faithful to God in this life. They don't need this other garbage. All of that is nothing but fairy tale nonsense. Doesn't do a bit of good for anybody. It's distraction. It's also playing with devils. That's what it ends up being. God's people need discipled in the book. Not discipled in visions, not disciple, not discipled in visions, not discipled in in uh, extra biblical revelations, in in sign gifts and tongues and any of that stuff. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we're supposed to do that. But that's what people want to do. Why? Because it's easier to do all those things than to live for God. It's easier to do that than to walk in sanctification. 
It's more fun to do that stuff. It's more fun to have to feel like you have superpowers. And that's what they're doing. That's what they want to do. They don't want to live for God. They don't want to walk in the fear of the Lord. They want things prophesied unto them. They want, they, they want foolishness and nonsense prophesied unto them. That's what they want. That's what they want to do. They don't want to live for God. They don't want to walk with God. They want all the extra, they want all these extra things. They want extra biblical revelations. That's what they want. And they lust after them. And guess what? God's going to give these charismatics and is giving these charismatics and Pentecostals exactly what they want. Their strong delusion. <clears throat> he is giving it to them. And they are getting it. They're going to have it. All right, everybody, I'm done. I will get a um, song going here. Right? And give you an opportunity to say hi before uh, we go here. I got a lot of work to do. I got to go pray and walk and then eat some supper and, and then do some work out in the back and get ready for all kinds of things. So let's see here. Let me find... Hang on, I know what I want to play. Let's see if I can find it. There it is. Oh, I lost it. Hold on. There it is. Let's see. Well, I am on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. How did it?
Yes, I'm on the winning side Out in sin no more Will I abide I've invested in the fight For the cause of truth and right Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. Well, I am on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. How did say? everybody god bless you all uh somebody asked for our giving information you can paypal us at salvationpreacher at gmail.com and uh or you can do venmo we do that you can do uh you can mail us something if you like here's our information at the bottom of the page here it is 10 30 south highway 3 northfield minnesota 55057 um uh let's see and um let's see you could also do uh cryptocurrency some people do that too as well uh you had me at the feathers yeah uh somebody asked how many danielle asked how many times do you have to do a broadcast about charismatics um as many as many times as necessary till there's none left um that's how many times but anyway um we definitely uh, have to talk about uh, charismatics. It's important that we uh, we do that uh, because there's a lot of people deceived by them, a ton of them. So, um, and thank you to the person that just sent us a gift through PayPal there. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate all the gifts and the prayers and everything. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take off here. I got to get some work done, but God bless you all. Take care. And Lord willing, we will see you Monday. Next week's schedule, Monday and Wednesday broadcast, but that's probably it uh, for the week, uh, Monday and Wednesday, because a lot going on. I will. Voidex said, do Hebrew roots sometimes. Good idea, Voidex. I agree with that. I think I need to do that again. It's been a long time. I think I'll go through, you just gave me a great idea. I think I'll go through the notes, my some of my notes that I have and some things down and go back through those. Uh, it's been a while since I've talked about that and the Sabbath day issue. Uh, I think, what you know what? Why don't I combine it? I think I need to talk about the Sabbath day issue again. So why don't we do that? I will do that. I will teach on the Sabbath again and... Um, Hebrew roots and the Sabbath. Maybe next week I'll, I'll use, I got a ton of notes on it. I'll do Hebrew roots and the Sabbath on Monday and Wednesday. Okay, so why don't we do that? Lord willing, that's what we'll do. We'll spend one on the Sabbath day and we'll spend one on the Hebrew roots movement. And uh, time to review some things. Uh, that's a good idea. So let's, let's do that for sure. Uh, anyway, God bless you all. Take care. Uh, yeah, there's definitely, you can always talk more about it. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, anyway, all right, everybody.